though this countering of distortions is very much needed and the need of the art, what we observed is there is something grossly lacking from the Hindu side. And that is a comprehensive and grand narrative from Hindu side. To put it more clearly, how I, as an insider to these traditions, to this land, as an inheritor of the civilization, how do I view my past? Invasions kept happening, our people kept repelling. There was no subjugation till 6th century. But what actually transformed the landscape of the entire world is the advent of Islam onto the earth. So Islamic period needs a little more attention, not just because it was the longest and not because uh, they these people ruled our territories for some time, but also because it is during this period, most of the stereotypes we have mentioned, we have talked a little while before, those stereotypes have emerged during this period. Namaste, Suswagatam. A uh, very good morning to one and all. First of all, I would like to thank Sri Rahul Devanji, Tanya Ji, and the entire Sangam Talks team uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Coming straight into the topic, this talk is titled as Bharatiya Itihasa and Insider Perspective. Before I jump to the main content, uh, let me briefly explain you why we thought this talk is necessary. This talk is primarily aimed at serving two purposes. Uh, we all know for a fact that Bharatiya history over the last 200 years has been completely distorted. Uh, the process that was initiated by the British and was later continued even after the independence by our own people, especially leftist historians, at times with the active support from the state. At the same time, there were numerous efforts and attempts by very well-meaning and scholarly people such as Jadunath Sarkar, R.C. Mojumdarji, Kota Venkateshalam Garu, and Rushnav Satnaran Garu in Telugu. So to correct these distortions, even in recent times, there have been many efforts and immense contributions from various people, especially after the advent of social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, and all these efforts somehow created mass awareness amongst the people. But though this countering of distortions is very much needed and the need of the art, what we observed is there is something grossly lacking from the Hindu side. And that is a comprehensive and grand narrative from Hindu side. Uh, to put it more clearly, how I, as an insider to these traditions, to this land, as an inheritor of the civilization, how do I view my past? So this talk is basically is a small attempt in the direction in providing a basis for the grand narrative. We don't claim this itself is a grand narrative, but this provides a basis for the grand narrative. At the same time, when those distortions were manufactured by the enemy, and during the same time, when those distortions were corrected by our own people, during this entire process, certain stereotypes have emerged from the, both the camps and they have penetrated deep into the collective conscience of the society. So this talk is also aimed at addressing certain stereotypes uh, to evaluate how, how far they are tenable and refute whenever necessary. So let me briefly explain you some of the stereotypes that have deep penetrated in our psyche. The first being the history of Bharat is a testimony for the triumph of the organized West. This view is not held by an ordinary people like you and me. This view is held by the people who are most responsible, who held most responsible positions and highest positions. People who often hailed as founding fathers of our constitution. One of those great figures once said, the life of a Hindu is that of a continuous defeat. They went on to this, they went on to say that there is nothing to learn from Hindu history. The history of Bharat is that of a defeated race. So what actually the stereotype did is it prompted it, it made very well-meaning people also to make organizing the society itself as a goal of their life. Then there was another stereotype which we are familiar with. That is, India was never a nation. There was no Indian nationhood before the British came. 
learned people scholarly people may not fall prey to this narrative but this narrative is propagated especially we, this narrative we find in the textbooks of ncert in the 8th and 9th standards where the target is young budding minds and we can understand once this particular mindset is implanted in those budding minds it is impossible later on to inculcate the feeling of any concept of rashtra in them and the next next two stereotypes these are the most dangerous in fact most debilitating stereotypes that have been promulgated by the west or western interest and unfortunately taken at their face value even by our own people the most important of them being we lack political unity right from ages we never had this political unity our kings fought among themselves enabling the enemy to take advantage of it so we are made to believe that our hindu kings have always been selfish not just that they did not come together at times they sided with the enemy which eventually resulted in our downfall what actually it did believing in this stereotype has resulted in undermining the contributions made by our own people and unnecessary self flagellation and even more dangerous proposition made by the west is that our society was always divisive and exploitative exploitative on the lines of varna or caste this stereotype went to such an extent that the most influential people belonging to the most powerful hindu organizations have started believing this stereotype and parroting the line that the last 2000 years of oppression and exploitation we have to correct them so in the process what they did they have started reforming hindu society which actually is a formless and there are many other stereotypes one of them being all that we have in the last 2000 years if you talk of mahatmas we have one mahat buddha and one gandhi similarly if you talk of superheroes all that we have one shivaji one rana pratap and who too were duly let down by our own people making way for the enemy and one more you can call this one more allegation or stereotype whatever this is we lack military sense we lost our enemy because we never had a proper military strategy we never had proper military sense and indians also lack this distinction between who is an insider who is an outsider as a result of as a result of which people started making alliances without realizing the outcome of those alliances today we do the post mortem analysis after 1000 years we stamp one raja man singh one jai singh having sided with moguls and start blaming them but we don't understand had the rajputs not made those alliances if today we look into the bharatvarsha as such the two most hindu dominated states are gujarat and rajasthan from where actually the foreign aggressions have taken place so had those kings not made those alliances those two states would have been completely islamized so without taking without considering all these facts we simply brand our own people so before getting into the actual history it is always desirable to understand how traditional bharata stood i'll quickly go through this slide uh, we always know that there were 56 deshas deshas were cultural units and there were multiple rajas rajya was a political unit with a varying boundary desha is more of permanent nature whereas rajya is a temporal one from time to time there have been efforts to unify the entire all the rajas to bring them under one umbrella most of the time they are performing a particular yaga like ashwamedha rajasuya vaishnava and the uh, dynamics of rajya and desha are very fluid in the sense one rajya can spread across many deshas and there can be multiple rajas forming in uh, ruling one desha to make the th- things much simpler hastina and the prastha these two are very prominent rajas but they were never deshas whereas there were deshas like gauda silhartha which were deshas but there there is no such kingdom like gauda and silhartha political scenario was such that a strong empire at the center was desirable so we had at times there was a magadha empire there was andhra shatavana empire ruling really most of the country a strong empire at the center was desirable but lack of the same was never a hindrance to fight them we were always made to believe that since we did not have an organized empire at the center we lost to the enemy because small kingdoms were fighting the big kingdoms 
but actually that wasn't the case any time and every raja had this sense of inside and outside view perfectly with respect to both his raja as well as to the dharma so if he is a vidharma even if he belonged to the within uh, same raja he was punished so with this small understanding of bharata as rashtra let's begin our journey into the history where do we begin this from so let's begin this from the most famed alexander's indian campaign so it may appear a little preposterous uh, to begin the history of a nation whose beginning in fact whose beginning is unknown with an event that has happened only 2000 years back but doing so has got some merits in it the alexander's campaign of india is an easily reconcilable event from the westerners view point though it is it remained most of the times it remained insignificant in the eyes of traditional ethnographers let us quickly glance through what actually happened with alexander most of us know it in greater detail so i'll just glance through so alexander beyond any doubt was the greatest warrior the western world had produced he inherited a small piece of kingdom from his father set out to conquer the entire world he defeated the mightiest empires of those times uh historians often say more important than alexander's winning streak is the consummate ease with which he won those territories there was no opposition literally there was no opposition till he reached persia even he conquered darius iii with utmost ease what aided his military victories uh, was the impregnable phalanx it was unbroken actually most of the times and he had fast moving cavalry to his advantage and the generalship of the uh, alexander all this put together it made easy for him to conquer the world so with the same after having conquered persia he entered bharat when he entered bharat let's have a small look at i mean a brief look at this map it is always desirable to know the strengths and weaknesses how both the sides stood just before the battle took place so on one hand we had one kingdom which spread half of the world facing which was a small king when he entered bharat he faced porus we all know but before facing porus uh alexander had to fight with small tribes in india like bazira masaga and ora it is said that alexander had lost major chunk of his army to these tribes and he had to resort to treachery to overcome these tribes so finally when he arrived into the bharat and faced porus porus was also to take a meddon at the banks of the zhelum or vitasta the river vitasta this is also known as battle of hydaspes and this actually the end of alexander's dream of conquering the world after this we all know that he returned there were different reasons given for his return but let's briefly try to understand what actually happened during the battle field initially alexander was taken on by the son of the porus porus son took him head on wounded and wounded alexander even killed alexander's most beloved horse bisphalus and almost single handed did decide the fate of the battle but unfortunately he was killed then porus took alexander head on and porus strategy to greek was simple because the strength of the greek army had always been the phalanx formation and its cavalry to counter this what porus did was very simple he placed the bearded elephants at the front infantry behind the elephants and cavalry on both the flanks facing war elephants for the first time greek army faced Many in opposition, but they never faced war elephants in a in an actual battle. So facing war elephants for the first time for Greek army and it had no answers for raging elephants. Greek phalanx was broken, the army was shattered. Uh, historians say sometimes Macedonians were stamped under the foot of elephants. They got crushed, and the enemy was so frightened. The Greek army was so frightened with the kind of havoc created by the elephants that they never wanted to see elephants again in their lives. so the overall point here is to not to emphasize the fact that alexander was routed which in fact happened or may not have happened because the outcome of the battle remained most more or less inconclusive but the emphasis is more on the narrative that was built post alexander's return so this is what actually happened alexander came all the way from macedonia conquering most parts of the world he came here he met al porus and he returned we don't know what actually happened in the battle the return was a factual statement the reasons given for greek return 
some of the Greek historians noted like not ordinary people like Auri, Arian, Plutarch, all these people said uh, overcoming porous was beyond the reach of the Greek army. And then they say they conquered porous, they returned to Greek, and the reasons given were very not so convincing. They say the Greek army faced a shortage of food. Isn't it quite astonishing that they have traveled all the way from Macedonia to Persia, which was most desert area, arid region. And once they reach Panchanada region, which is the most fertile in the world, and then they complain of the food, doesn't make any sense actually. Then they also give another reason that the Greek army turned homesick. homesick. Let's for a while accept this theory. But a homesick army usually takes the most familiar route and the easiest route and the shortest possible route. But what Greek army did actually, it took southwards because it was fearing the backlash from the tribals which they overcame with treachery. And another narrative is that Alexander was, this is also we find in textbooks of the kids. Alexander was very magnanimous enough in returning the porous kingdom. But actually, Alexander's conduct previous, previously doesn't match this uh, narrative. Because when he conquered Persia, uh, the capital city, Persepolis, was complete. The kind of hooliganism demonstrated by Alexander doesn't fit into this narrative. Then the Greek historians said they were aided by the king of Takshashila, Ambi. This is also one narrative Hindu said takes that our own people ditched us. Okay. So the king of Takshashila helped him in overcoming porous. But what, we need to understand, just now we have had the understanding of Raja and Desha. Takshashila was never a Raja, never a Desha. Takshashila was always a part of Kashmir. Kashmir Desha, Kashmir Raja. So it is a gross Greek mis confusion in understanding anything that is Indian. Unfortunately, we too started parroting the same thing. There was no kingdom called Takshashila and you cannot have a king to that. And finally, if at all, let's for a moment assume that Alexander made some impact in the Bharat, but Alexander was never mentioned in any detail in the Indian historian accounts. Selikas was mentioned in great detail. The uh, encounter between Selikas and Samudra Gupta was mentioned in greater detail, but Alexander wasn't. So in a nutshell, Alexander's Indian campaign is a total disaster. Uh, if you have to put it in a short summary, it is the story of the most acclaimed and the greatest warrior the Western world had produced, venturing into Bharat only to be tamed and completely decimated by a local king and was forced to retreat. Alexander was never considered to have posed any big challenge to Bharat and our historians considered him too insignificant to mention in great detail. So this is how Alexander's the lesson we have to learn from Alexander is that we carried the same misconceptions. We started looking at our own things through the lens of the West. That is how they confused Desha, we also confused Desha. We, they confused Raja, we confused Raja. They confused Varna system, we confused Varna system. It continued later on. Too. Then Alexander was neither the first nor the last to invade our country. Many invasions have happened before him and after him. As such, aggressions were not unique to Bharat alone. Aggressions happened all over the world. But what differentiates Bharat from the rest of the civilizations is a sense of urgency demonstrated, continuously demonstrated by Hindu kings in repelling and invading force. This was demonstrated all through our history. For example, I'll set a few examples here. Few of uh, these four of different kind. We all know that Ashoka, Paryas was the first non-secular king of this land. He completely weakened Chatra. Uh, Bharatata, who followed him, was busy imposing Buddhism on the people and debilitated the army. Yavanas were waiting for an opportunity and they stuck at the most vulnerable moment. Magadha was on the verge of losing. Then Pushyamitra, who was the Sena Jaksha then, then he didn't hesitate to dethrone Bharatata. He took the charge and he ascended the throne. He readied the army in a very quick time and drove the enemy back to Gandhara. The point to be noted here is that the very first repel or repulsion from the Bharat side, Pushyamitra, drove the Evanas back to Gandhara, emphasize the point to be taken here is that every king thereafter, right from the Pushyamitra, every king thereafter had a clear understanding of the borders of Varsha. Even though Evanas penetrated deep into Magadha, he drove them back till Gandhara left them there. And now just that Pushyamitra 
uh, took the task of bringing the entire country under one political union. And towards this end, he performed an Ashwamedha Yaga. Perhaps that is the last Ashwamedha performed in the Kali. And then came Hoons. Hoons were the most feared and the most barbaric race in the world. Uh, they came from Central Asia, we all know. They penetrated deep into the Bharat. They came till the Madhya Bharat. And much contrary to the popular notion that Hindu kings were never united, Hindu kings always fought among themselves. Here we see a, ma a small Malwa king, Ashodharma, who formed a formidable alliance with neighboring states. Like he took into consideration the Magadha, the Avanta, Avantika, and all of the small states. They formed an alliance and drove the Hunas out of this country. Then comes Vikramaditya. This is the most unfortunate thing in our history. The period of Vikramaditya is undoubtedly the golden period in Bharatiya Itihasa. But it is quite laughable that two of the greatest kings we ever had, Vikramaditya and Shalivahana, who in fact were Shakakartas, on whose names there were Shakas, one in North India, one in South India. These two names did not find place in our history textbook, not by Western historians. Even on the Hindus, our obsession with historicity has become so deep that we too do not validate, we too do not know much about these two kings. So demonstrate how tall Vikramaditya stands when compared to all other kings. Uh, if at all, I have to give an example. Uh, if only Rana Pratap and Shivaj have become superheroes uh, for containing and resisting the barbaric Islam for a few decades, then imagine this king, the Vikramaditya, who forget about the enemy entering deep into their country. He crossed the borders. He destroyed 16 Malaysia countries at one time. And when he, he made some of them, Vaisal, Sutra, Jyotisha, Kataka, Simakuri, and then the nature deshas like Dara, Dara, Uraga, Abhira, Gandhara. So, and he conquered Bahalika, Shaka, Ramata, and Huna. So, what actually this episode did is this particular conquest of Vikramaditya prevented the Malaysia Deshas to look at India for another 120 years. They, it prevented, it watered them from coming to India. Then followed by him was his great grandson, Shalivana. Shalivana's episode is very important from today's point of view because the times of Shalivana were no different from what they are today. Uh, Yavanas did not actually invade. Actually, they intruded deep into the city. They were growing in numbers. They were growing in influence. Uh, there was no powerful kingdom at the center. All that Shalivana had was a small kingdom. He had to. There is a legend to Shalivana which tells that Shalivana made his entire army out of clay toys. Maybe that is a symbolic way of telling. As so say, he was awakening a society which was in deep slumber. And then he had to draw the enemy till he is the first to cross border much deeper. He went to the extent of Khorasan and drove the enemy till that point. So, these four episodes, Pushyamitra, Pushyamitra is the one who single-handedly drove the enemy out. Ashodharma stands example for how Hindu kings, were, Hindu kings were united time and again to drive the enemy out. Vikramaditya is a proactive conqueror, whereas Shalivahana symbolizes the rise of renaissance of a civilization. Throughout these examples, one particular salient feature that stands out is that whenever there was an attack, or even when there was no attack, the sense of urgency demonstrated by Hindu kings in repelling a foreign aggressor or thwarting a foreign aggressor from entering Bharat is unmatched. Uh, aggressions kept happening, invasions kept happening, our people kept repelling. There was no subjugation till 6th century. But what actually transformed the landscape of the entire world is the advent of Islam onto the earth. So Islamic period needs a little more attention, not just because it was the longest and not because uh, they, these people ruled our territories for some time, but also because it is during this period, most of the stereotypes we have mentioned, we have talked a little while before, those stereotypes have emerged during this period. We are made to believe that this period is our, is of our downfall. We were nowhere close to our enemy. But if you observe clearly and analyze rationally, it is this period that tells how distinct we were, how distinguished Bharat as a society was, and how adaptive we were when compared to others. Why? Because during the same period, there were empires, civilizations that fell at the very first strike of the enemy, and they never recovered. And even before that, Greek fell, Rome fell, they never recovered, Egyptian fell, they never recovered. But here we are talking of a nation that having withstood centuries of foreign aggressions, be it Greek, Ahun, Shaka, Evan, even after such 
uh, withstanding those aggressions, took on an even more barbarous enemy with the same vigor, and eventually became victorious. So it is always but let's see how Islam stood actually before understanding, before getting into the details of the battles that were fought between Hindus and Muslims. This is how Islamic empire stood. We all know uh, the first call for jihad was given around 620s. And ever since that first call was given, within a short span of 80 years, by 708, Islam conquered half of the world. People used to say that there was no stopping of the Islamic sword. So, by the end of 700, Islam spread till Europe. It occupied part of the Africa. It was a major force in the Central Asia. Then when, when did it start entering Bharat? Now I'll give you another graph. The first attack of the Bhar the first attack of Islam on Bharat took place in 636. They tried to invade Sin, but it was a failed attempt. But from then, from 636, let's talk about an idea. This ideology, which subjugated half of the world in a span of 80 years, it took almost 570 years from 636 to 1206 when they had their first Delhi Sultanate in Delhi. It took almost 570 years for them to have a strong hold in Bharat. That itself tells a story how valiant our kings were, how brave our ancestors fought against this ideology. Then what actually happened with Islam is Islam spread much of much of the world during the times of the first four caliphs. But four caliphs ended their lives without seeing any success in Bharat. But their first success came in the form of Muhammad bin Qasim. So Muhammad bin Qasim was a chosen invader by the Caliphate. Because he was a small king, the entire Caliphate supported him. And finally, Muhammad bin Qasim pulled the entire Islamic Caliphate with the support, part support from Iraq's governor, gathered a huge contingent of more than one lakh army and marched against Sin. Sin then was ruled by Raja Dahir. But even after such a huge contingent and such a huge army, the fate wasn't much different from the earlier episodes. Till some Buddhist monks sided with Muhammad bin Qasim with the false hope that he would conquer Raja Dair and eventually help them out in bringing their monasteries back. So this proved very fatal for, for the Hindu side because Muhammad bin Qasim had an upper hand. Someone who could overcome Raja Dahir. But as the fate would have it, Qasim killed these Buddhist monks too. But even after Raja Dai's death, these events are very important from the point of view of Hindu uh, side. They had a two-way impact. First, immediately after Raja Dai's death, uh, the kind of uh, bravery shown by Raja Dai, it gave the Islamic world first test of Hindu bravery. Then, how Hindu women can react to such, some situations because what actually happened was uh, upon killing Raja Dahir, Muhammad bin Qasim captured both the daughters, uh, Surya Devi and Parmala Devi. He sent both of them as gifts to Caliphate and the kind of treatment that was meted out not to these two ladies, but the, most of the women, they were enslaved, uh, they were taken to Mirachadeshas, they were used as sex slaves. Uh, mass rapes have happened. So the kind of treatment given to women once the Islam started winning, this has changed the women's mindset of Hindu women's mindset forever. So we can say this also acted as the harbinger for certain customs such as Johar in the later centuries. The story of this Surya Devi and Parma Devi is also very important of importance in the sense that these two did not remain quiet once they were uh, taken to Caliph, they somehow impressed Caliph and they wanted to avenge the death of their father. So what they did, they impressed Caliph and somehow got his stamp in saying that uh, bring the Muhammad bin Qasim at any cost, either alive or dead. And Caliph, uh, the Caliph issued some orders to the effect that Muhammad bin Qasim should be killed. So that is how these two ladies took revenge for their father's death. But could Islam make deeper 
uh, private patients after this. The success of Qasim was very short-lived. Uh, upon hearing the news that Arabs could breach the sin, uh, the king of Chalak, the Chalakya king Pulakesi, who was at the down south, uh, southern part of the Bharat, he was a vassal of Vikramaditya too. He led a strong army and drove the Arabs back. And once again, he drove these Arabs back till Gandhara. Intention was never to never uh, allow these Muslims to settle. So every uh, after that, Arabs uh, tried their efforts. Arabs continued attacking Bharat. At times, they changed the direction. Since Sindh was uh, Sindh again became impenetrable, they changed their route. They tried their luck from the Kashmir, but unfortunately, to the Muslim for Muslims, uh, the king over there, Lalita Aditya, was very brutal. He was so powerful. Uh, they got a very bad beating in the hands of Lalita Aditya. Lalita Aditya drove them back, not just out of the Kashmir, but he chased them till Multan. And then for uh, Muslims had to take shelter in a temple. The kind of iconoclast they have been all through their lives, but they did not hesitate entering the Hindu temple and take a shelter in order to protect their lives. So once Lalita Aditya drove them out, Arab's story was more or less over. This is another stereotype that has been propagated amongst us. That is, Arabs could not penetrate sin. Somehow, Hindu kings were very successful in resisting Arab kings. But we were not so successful against the Turks. The moment when Islamic world went into the hands of Turks, and when Turks onslaught happened on the Bharat, we succumbed. Let's examine whether that holds any water. It is true that they had a little success in the form of Alakudin and Subaktadin. These two were two Turkish slaves, uh, one of them being the father of Mahmud, the Gaj Mahmud of Gajani. So these two Alakudin and Subaktadin conquered uh, then the Bharat in the northwestern frontier was ruled by Shahi dynasty Raja Jaipala. Raja Jaipala was too old by then. But even then, once he lost, but immediately uh, he bounced back, he launched a counter-attack on the Gajanabi and put them in check. But things changed once Mahmud entered the scene. Mahmud as Alexander to the Western world, Mahmud was definitely one of the bravest or one of the most uh, ferocious warriors the Islamic world had ever produced. So, Mahmud invaded Bharat, defeated Jaipala, drove Jaipala back towards Delhi. During this battle, Jayapala lost his son Anandapala as captive to Muhammad. Then Anandapala was later converted to Islam. So now Raja Jayapala did not keep quiet. So he immediately came back, uh, formed the confederation with the rest of the Hindu kings. Again, let's uh, if we keep an eye on the popular notion that Hindu kings were never united, I gave you quite a few examples like Ashwadharman. And during the Islamic period, this Jaipala's confederation was very, very stronger because it was taking on an enemy behind whom the entire caliphate stood. Gajni was on the other side, but Jaipala did not fear the enemy. He formed a confederation, immediately bounced back and attacked Gajnavi. Somehow he freed his son. Some Muslim historians went on to say that during this battle, this particular battle of 1001, Raja Jaipala had an upper hand. To such an extent that the sword of Raja Jayapala was hanging at the neck of Muhammad, Gajini, Muhammad of Gajini. So he could have killed him, but he had a stake, uh, his son being under the captive of Muhammad. So they made a truce, they came back. So Muhammad, after this defeat, Muhammad, Muhammad to change his direction. Muhammad went through Kashmir, but again, he to face an ignominious defeat in the hands of Rana Sangrama Raja. So Muhammad come, again came back. Most of the historians keep telling us that Muhammad of Ghazni invaded Bharat for 17 times. Let's assume that Muhammad invaded 17 times, which is a fact in fact. But isn't it common sense that if a person had to invade Bharat for 17 times, what would have happened the previous 16 times? He was definitely lost. He was definitely defeated. So, Muhammad tried his luck from different uh, areas, I mean, different sites. Once he went to Kashmir, once he went to Northwestern, once he went through Gujarat Patihara Rajas. So all the time facing Mahmud was Raja Jaipala and Shahi dynasty. So finally, eventually Mahmud 
somehow defeated Raja Jayapala. Raja Jayapala handed over the reins to Anandapala and committed suicide. And Anandapala did not deter. Anandapala continued the fight where his father left. So all the three generations, Anandapala, Tilosanapala, Bhimapala, Bhimapala is said to have uh, frightened Gajani to such an extent that he had to flee from the battlefield. So all these four people, Jayapala, Anandapala, Tilosanapala, and Bhimapala, they rendered their lives uh, protecting our boundaries. So with finally, this is what Albirini had to say, the kind of uh, bravery Hindu Shahiya dynasty has shown is nowhere to be seen. So once he could overpower the Shahi dynasty, Gajni thought, just as Alexander thought after conquering Persia, Gajni thought, uh, I mean, it, it would be a cakewalk because he had uh, overpowered the most powerful Shahi dynasty then. So Muhammad thought the next ventures would be a cakewalk. But much to his surprise, uh, he was badly beaten again. This time he was he penetrated deep into the central Asia, central Bharat. Then he faced Vidyadara Chandra Atreya. Chandra Atreya Vidyadara, the folk story goes, completely decimated Gajani. So he could Gajani had no option but to retreat. And he had to enter, he, uh, he was forcefully entered into a truce with Chandra Atreya Vidyadara paying much of the bounty. He could not digest this insult because Gajani was badly beaten by Vidyadara. So on his way back, he thought of attacking Boja Paramara. But Boja Paramara was even more brutal on Gajani. So Gajani was once again badly beaten. Again, he made a truce. Then while his way back to Gajanavi, he went through Gujarat and he showed his anger on the unarmed civilians. He killed many civilians on his way back. He destroyed Sumna temple. We all know that. He killed the uh, armless Brahmins over there. And throughout this Gajani's campaign, there was one young boy who accompanied him. That was his nephew, Salar Masood. So once Gajani was driven back, Salar Masood uh, thought he would avenge his uncle's defeat. So Salat Masood followed his uncle's footsteps, ventured into Bharat, not ordinarily like Gajani did, but he again, uh, the entire caliphate stood behind him. He ventured, it is said that he entered Bharat with more than one lakh army, with 40,000 cavalry, and much bigger army than any Islamic invader came thus far. So, but this time, the Hindus did not take him head on because they knew this time the entire caliphate was behind. Salad Masood, and we never had a bigger uh, Rajja there. So, what Hindu kings, this kind of strategic acumen displayed by Hindu kings was really something noteworthy. He was, Salad Masood was allowed to penetrate deep into Bharat till Meerut. He crossed Gandhara, he crossed Sindh, he crossed Delhi, he crossed Uttar Pradesh. He penetrated deep into Meerut. And he reached Bhairaj. Till that point in time, every king surrendered. And every king surrendered, saying that we could, we were no match to you. So it forced uh, Salar Masood to believe that he was too powerful, so he can keep marching ahead. So once he entered the Meerut, Hindu kings who already formed a strong alliance under the leadership of Raja Suhail Dev, uh, took him head on at Battle of Bhairaj, encircled Salar Masood. In such a way that all, once again, there were five Rajas which came together to encircle Salar Masood. And it is noted that not even a single soldier was spared even to carry the news back to Gajni. So this decisive victory of Hindus halted the Muslim march for at least another 50 years till Gauri Muhammad entered the scene. And we all know that Muhammad Gauri uh, is duels with, with uh, Prithviraj Chauhan, uh, the story of Muhammad Gauri is reasonably well known. But what is lesser known is that he had initially faced the most shameful defeat at the hands of a Rani of Gujarat. Because uh, since it was uh, in the Islamic world, the uh, discussion was always happening. It was impossible for them to pass through northwestern frontier because one king or the other always halting. 
and uh, passing through Kashmir has always been impossible because Galit Aditya, Rana Sangaram Raja gave them bod bodily blows. The, the only way they could think of entering Bharat and making strong inroads into the Bharat was through Gujarat. So once Mohammed Gauri came to know that the king of Gujarat, Solanke, uh, died, and his son was too young to take over the reins. So he was Mula Raja, he was just 14 years old. So he thought this to be an opportunity. So what Gauri did, uh, he invaded Gujarat. But what he did not know was Mula Raja was capable enough of taking Gauri head on. And not just that, even his mother, Rani Naiki Devi was also in the battlefield. So he was meted out uh, again the most shameful defeat the Islamic any Islamic invader had ever faced. The Islamic historians, for the sake of saving their face, say that oh no no we were not defeated by Mullah Raja but we were defeated by Rani Naiki Devi. But whoever it is, Muhammad Ghori was driven out of the Gujarat. Then he changed the route. He entered Delhi to northwestern again. Uh, the legend has it that the duels between Prithviraj Chauhan and Muhammad Ghori was maybe 16 times or two times. Whatever it is, Prithviraj Chauhan always had an upper hand against Ghori. And this is where the popular notion comes again into the picture. Our kings had this trait of Sadguna Vikruti of letting the enemy go when he had an opportunity to kill him. But Cap taking captive of the enemy king or enemy camp and releasing them happens as part and parcel of the warfare. So when Prithviraj Chauhan took captive of Muhammad Ghori, he let him go. That was true. Muhammad Ghori eventually overcame Prithviraj Chauhan and killed him. That is also true. But most of the times what we say, uh, this is where our military acumen was uh, flawed because we could have chased uh, Gauri till his point. But what the point we were missing is that when an enemy invader invades country, he penetrates deep into our territory. Prithviraj Chauhan was defending and he was defending with his elephants. So you cannot expect an elephant filled army to chase a cavalry filled army and catch hold him off and kill him. But of all these incidents, be it Gajani, be it Salad Masood, be it Gori, all these belong to Turkish uh, lineage. So the notion that we could tame the Arabs but not the Arabs also falls flat in the sense that we could resist Turkish onslaught also for long. This is, uh, this is where our military acumen comes into picture. These are the depictions taken, by, taken from Kajraho uh, temples. This is the warfare between Boja and Gajani. As we all know, all those enemies who invaded us from uh, Arabia, their strength was cavalry. But uh, Boja, what he did, he offered an uh, infantry as bait to the fast moving cavalry so that the enemy thought he can have a haywire with the enemy camp, go and kill them and come back. But what the Gajani did not know was behind the infantry there was elephants on which there were mounted archers. Mounted long range archery has always been our strength. So that is how Gajani was decimated both at the hands of Raja Vijayadara and Raja Boja. Now there were Arabs, there were Turks, there were Mughals, there were Iranians. People kept coming. There were relentless attacks. When we analyze the past events, some stereotypes were, were assumed to be true. Like the uh, or certain contributions were never highlighted basically. So the kind of contributions the women rulers or women warriors made throughout this period. We have just learned about how Rani Naiki Devi tamed Muhammad Ghori. Not just her. Even before that, Kafite Rudrama was very ferocious against enemies. There was a queen ruler. Then, as far as uh, our tussle with the Islamic invaders were concerned. Uh, we all know this Taimur Elang who was very brutal, who killed more than 3 lakh people in one single day in Delhi. He was on his way back, was driven out by a tribal girl by name Rampari Gurjar. This Rampari Gurjar led at 40,000 tribal women against this Taimur Elang. He was caught by surprise. He did not have an answer to counter this women or women army. He fled. This is also not told to us most of the times. 
then the most important contribution made by women in the form of Johars was most of the times undermined. Johar is always uh, depicted as if uh, an evil practice, a practice that was not necessary. What actually this Johar did, let's understand with an example. So we know that there were three Johars in the history. The third Johar happened during the period of Akbar. But when it happened, the intention, uh, we can find it in seizure of Chittur. Ag Akbar had an eye on the queen of Chittur. As we all know, Akbar was always a, is a womanizer. He wanted that queen badly, so he invaded Chittur. Fair enough. But what it actually made was Akbar started his invasion to Chittur in the month of October. Chittur resisted for four long months. He fought four long months. He lost most of his army. He lost most of his resources for four long months, but still Akbar was hoping to have that queen alive. So after fighting for four months, then when he entered the fort, he was welcomed by an immense crematorium where the queen along with 1700 other women have committed a Johar. So this made, this forced Akbar to rethink his strategy. Actually, he invaded Chittar only to get hold of the queen. But what actually happened in spite of spending so many resources, he could not get the queen. At the same time, he lost all his resources. He thought, if I go by this, uh, this method, it is impossible to have any hold on this Bharat. So, for the first time in the history of Islam, the most barbaric race called Islam turned a little civilized in the name of Deen Elahi, which was started by Akbar. Then he started making alliances with Rajputs. He started marrying them, giving some scope for the king's house. So this is the kind of contribution made by a single Johar. And these Johars, as I said in, earlier, uh, the kind of treatment meted out to Surya Devi and Parmala Devi, and even to the Rani Samyukta after Gauri conquered uh, Prithviraj Chauhan, all these things made Hindu women feel a little unsafe at the hands of the Muslim conquerors. Then there was Rani Karnavati. Rani Karnavati, Tem Shahjahan. And the story of Rani Bhavashankari is even more interesting in the sense that Akbar also wanted to expand towards East. So he had an eye on Bengal. Rani Bhavashankari was the queen of Gauri Shrestha. Uh, he somehow wanted the Patans over there to have a control on the Bengal. What Rani Bhavashankari did, she knew this plan of Akbar and she proactively engaged in a war with Patans and she killed Osman Khan, the king of Patans over there. She sent his head as a gift to Akbar and she sent a message to Akbar, Dear Emperor, you are most welcome to Bengal. We invite you for an invasion, but make sure that there is one person in Delhi to receive your head to. So after this, Akbar had no answer. Akbar never wanted to engage any with any any duel with Bhavashankari. He accepted the sovereignty of Rani Bhavashankari. Not just these few names like Rani Naiki Devi, Ram Pyar Gurzari, Karnavati, or Bhavashankari, even Kittur Chinnamma, Rani Rudzama Devi, Jansi Lakshmi, Ahalya Bhai Holkar. What actually, the one point we can take out of these examples is that throughout the history of this 2000 years, ever since Pushamitra till the Marathas, we had so many foreigners invading us, but we never had a foreign queen invading us, but we have had numerous queens protecting us. So that in itself tells how women were treated in this land. Women have always been, uh, what do you call, respected, not just respected, they were properly trained. They took the opportunity to protect the dharma when the time demanded. And the next and the most important Stereotype. This particular slide addresses the most important stereotype that has been propagated. Hindu society had always been divisive. We were divided. We were divided on the lines of caste. So let's check whether it was true. First of all, there we all know there were four varnas, and the four Westerners' accusation on us is that the remaining three varnas have exploited the fourth varna. Because again, this is because when one adopts an outsider prism, this is how Europe stood. There too, they had 
four classes in the form of the king, the peasant, the landlord, and the fed. So what they thought? Elite minority, they had exploited the majority. So the same thing might have happened here too. Therefore, the shooters were always exploited by the remaining three Varnikas. Let's examine this. Right from Maurice and the Gupta, the role of Brahminas in the society were always to safeguard the knowledge. So they were supposed to lead a very humble life. But when the situation demanded, when Evanas onslaught was there or when the king was uh, not doing well, we always have these people, Chanakya, created Magadha Empire out of Maurya Chandra Gupta. Then then we have Vidyaranya, who was the Shankaracharya of uh, Shringari Mata. So he came back. He mentored Hariharaya Rukaraya. He established Vijayanagara Empire, which uh, actually stopped, the inv- at least registered the invasions for 300 years. Then we have Vansamarta, who guided uh, Shubhaji. So then we had Pishwas who were Brahmins and who supported the Ponsles all the way. So then whenever the situation demanded, when the Dharma was in danger, the Brahmins plunged into the battlefield if required or made people who were ready for the war. Then we have these uh, Nayakas, Red Kings, Pondavidus. These three are just examples. These actually have come from Shudra lineage. These people have risen to the ruling class. And the kind of contributions these kings have made, ready, especially the Reddy kings and Kondavidus in resisting the foreign invasions, especially the Islamic invasions, is immense. So after the uh, downfall of Kakatiya Empire in the dawn, and till uh, Vijayanagara rose, during these 200 years, these are the people who protected this land. And these, all these were all these belong to Shudra lineage. Then there were tribals. We all know how Rana Pratap was registered by bills. And especially in the Andhra region, Gonds were uh, fighting against Nizams. Uh, Manan people were fighting against the British. Mahas played a very dominant role in Shivaji army. All these people are the so-called deprived or exploited people in the view of the Westerners or uh, yeah, enemies. And more importantly, the most astonishing fact is that the most prosperous empires of this land, the biggest and most prosperous, post Mahabharata. Post Mahabharata, the biggest empire was Magadha for 3000 years. So Magadha was most part of its tenure, was ruled by kings who rose from Chudra lineage, like Maurya, even Nandas, and thereafter. Not just the Varnas. Even Vaishas made their contribution by throughout this period, the community, trading community never stopped. They started supporting the ruling class with the required resources. So there were Chatras, there were Brahmanas, there were tribals, there were Shudras, and even the sannyasis. Sannyasis who were out of this fourfold Varna system, who were supposed to do tapas, who were not at all concerned with the material world. When they thought the Dharma was in danger, and we have the sampradayas coming, Sanyasi sampradayas, Gorak sampradaya, which had a very, very important role in playing, uh, driving the Islamic invaders out. And then we had got this demonstrated. We'll come to that battle of Gokul where Nagasadhus came from nowhere uh, to take the Duranis out of this country. Then we had Sanyasi movement. So then we have Banda Bairagi. So Sanyasi is too ventured. Even the, just we know so in the previous slide, we saw the contribution made by women. So, not one particular section, be it Brahmins, be it Chatra, be it Vaisha, Shudra, Sanyase, women, every part of the section contributed immensely towards protecting this Dharma. So, when an aggression of this scale, it is like an ocean hitting the shores. Continuous attacks for 1800 years, day in and day out, and no shore can withstand. At times it breaks, it happens. But when an aggression of this scale happens continuously, every section of the society suffers. Let's be a little honest about this. Not just one particular section of the society. Every section of the society suffers. Brahman suffered, Shatra suffered, Vaisha suffered, Sudha suffered, everyone suffered. That is the reason why every section came forward to fight this back. But unfortunately, we are playing into the hands of enemy's narrative and started making policies based on this. While talking of the Kshatra demonstrated by Hindu kings, most of the times we think we were fed with the battles that we lost. All the three Panipat battles were very famous. We were told in our textbooks, but none of Panipat battles was won by Hindu side. 
But what actually does that mean that we never won battles? As I mentioned, out of 128 battles that were fought during five, uh, 636 and five, uh, 1206, a hoping 108 battles were won by Hindu kings, a decisive victory for Hindu kings, but we were never told that. The same happened even during the Mughal period. We always remember this, we talk of this the Panipat battles. But Hemachandra Vikramaditya, who was a very brief period, ascended the throne of Delhi uh, immediately after Humayun. He had a 22 battle winning streak. It was unmatched till Peshwa came in. And then we talk of always talk of battle of Talikota, uh, which resulted in Hindu loss. And Talikota uh, is a lesson to be learned where the Muslim side switched, uh, Muslim switched the side in the, in the middle of the war. But we don't talk of battle of Rajur to demonstrate how grandier the battle was. Narrating the battle of Rajur, one Western historian wrote this way: Battle of Rajur happened in Rajur. It was uh, pronounced by Krishna Devaraya onto the Bahmani sultans. And Krishna Devaraya led a contingent. The contingent was so big that it consisted 11 lakh army, which is equivalent to Indian army today. It consisted 11 lakh infantry, 1.5 lakh cooks to support them, and more than one and a half lakh entertaining Vidushakas, we used to call them Vidushakas, musicians and all these people to entertain the army. So describing this contingent, one foreign historian wrote, it was as if a movie, it was not an army going for a battle, but it is as if a civilization was in move. This is how we described it. So battle of Raichu resulted in a decisive victory of Krishna Devaraya. That was the biggest battle fought on this set till date. But unfortunately, we were not told about this. Battle of Bhopal, the biggest battle fought in the 17th, 18th century, uh, which again resulted in the decisive victory of Marathas, which shows the uh, political acumen of Peshwa, Peshwa Bajirao. Somehow, these battles uh, left out of our memory. We had 27 years of war from 1682 to 1707, which again resulted in Marathas victory. Peshwa Bajirao had a successful march of 40 battles. He did most of the battles, most of those 40 battles, he won without even engaging in the actual fight. Then Battle of Gokul. Battle of Gokul, uh, from the Iranian side, after conquering Mathura, he left nothing else to destroy because Aurangzeb had already destroyed Mathura temple. So he thought of destroying Gokul, that is Vandavan. No one knows where this Nagasadis came from. This happened in 1757. Once Abdali had an upper hand. He wanted to show his might by destroying Gokul. Suddenly, he uh, sent he sent a ten thousand strong army to destroy Gokul. But Nagasadhus came and drove them back. He could not digest the insult. Again, sent another ten thousand army. Again, the same fate was meted out to the next contingent. Too. So Anglo Maratha was. So having seen all this, one thing we can be sure of. That right from Pushyamitra's time or even before that, the attacks kept happening, Hindus kept repelling. There was a pattern to it, but most importantly, there are certain lessons to be taken out, out of this. And people can, this is a small slide explaining how Hindu confederations was, were formed. These confederations are the big confederations like Ashwadharma forming to tame Hun, Hunas, Vikrama formed alliances, Charivana formed alliances. The Saubhuti Kata Yaudaya is very interesting because when Alexander invaded the country and went back, sensing the possible future invasion by an enemy, this uh, Malava and Chudraka, which were hostile to each other, they came together and they married the best of the people in both the Rajas to create a more strong breed in order to defend our country. This is this is what I mean by when every Raja had an insider-outsider distinction. So, Vayam Panchalikam Shatam always stood. When we were fighting, we were fighting. But when an outsider came, we are together. This sense always prevailed in this land. Raja Jaipala we knew. And Suhel Deva was a master class. Marathas formed alliances and Ayatas also formed alliances. And there is another myth. This is where the present discourse is heading towards. That is, Trying to strike a Hindu Muslim unity. Let us quickly analyze whether it is possible or not. How did Muslims fare? Because making alliances at times, as I said uh, in at the very beginning, 
that Hindu kings too made some alliances. Let's assume that had those Rajput kings uh, not made any alliances with the Mughals, what would have happened? The tyrant Mughal, because their strength was not enough to counter the uh, Islamic king, so they entered into a, an alliance to protect his subjects. Because they always knew if they could survive, one Shivaji could come up, one Dana Pratap could come up, one Guru Singh could come up and say the events, uh, safeguard their own people. So Muslims, have they ever showed loyalty to the interest of this land? Never. This is uh, time and again being repeated by Muslim sides. As I said earlier, during the battle of Talukota, Ramaraya had an upper hand till the noon. He was romping against the enemy. But what actually happened to Muslim generals who actually sided with Ramaraya switched sides in the name of Islam. And the same was done by Nawab of uh, Awadh during the third Panpat battle. When Sadashiro Babu was going there, Surajmal was clear right from the beginning that he would not take any sides. But this Awadh Nawab promised Sadashiro Babu that he would side with him. And at the last minute, he stopped food supplies to reach the Maratha army, but unfortunately, Sadashiv Babu took 1 lakh army as well as 2 lakh pilgrimages and the food supplies were not supplied. He cut short the food supplies as a result of which Sadashiv Babu lost the battle. Tipu at the right moment, when Marathas were uh, more or less victorious against Britain, uh, British, Tipu created a problem from down south. So Marathas had to shift their focus. Uh, fighting Tipu and fighting British. As a result, they lost to British, they could tame the Tipu. The same thing happened when these three I highlighted in red because these three Sultan, these two Nawabs are instrumental in handing over Bharat to British. So these three people played a very, very, oh, what do you call, shameful role in making us enslaved to British. Then the two faces of Muslims appeared even after the, just uh, post 1857. When we all know that there was a Khilafat movement, then Hindu Muslim unity was struck under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. Once uh, the rumor spread that Khilafat was reinstated, the true face of Muslims appeared and fights took place in Mopla. The same happened even during 1947 partition. So one lesson we have to learn the Muslims, only and only if it is inter in their interest, they may have sided with us. But most of the times in the name of Pan-Islam, they always fought against this land. In spite of all these attacks, in spite of relentless attacks, one distinction we have to make, if Muslims, if Muslim kings are winning battles, it is quite acceptable. But what makes their win easy is no Muslim king ever had a responsibility of building any civilization. But whereas Hindu kings on one hand fighting these relentless attacks and at the same time, created certain civilizations, certain big empires which are prosperous, a simple fact will demonstrate that during the same period when we were facing these attacks, from 1st century AD to 1820, India remained the number one, number one economy in the world. So we were prospering, we were, our arts were flourishing, sciences were flourishing, or everything was taken care by the Hindu kings. At the same time, they were also fighting. So these are some of the empires that were built during this period. Magadha, we all know the biggest of all empires. Vikramaditya's empire was the golden age, Charivanas, then all the, even Kakatiya, Vijayanagara, even today we have a standing testimony in the form of Ampere Vyundham. So what inferences can we draw out of this session? There are few inferences which are evident. Let me put it straight. Much is talked about lack of Hindu unity, but let's be a little rational in analyzing the events. Lack of Hindu unity is not the cause of our defeat, but it was the result of our losses. Political unity was demonstrated numerous times. What we lacked, even today what we lack, it is the lack of leadership, not the problem of the society. Let's not attribute the problems of the leadership to the society and malign the society in the society. Social structure was never a hindrance in upholding dharma. In fact, as long as Jati and Varna system were in place, we could tame the invaders. Only when they declined, we, we got surrendered to the enemy. Muslim loyalty had always been questionable. It had always sided with pan-Islam, not with the nation. Again, the present discourse makes an unreasoned comparison. We always highlight the, we always glorify the enemy, whereas we are very sharp in our criticism against our own people. We repeatedly say that we have disunity. 
it is a power game even muslims have their own uh, people who committed treachery everywhere in the world it happens it is a power game people by nature are like that but we attribute certain qualities only as if they are unique to hindu samaj which is not the case sadguna sadguna vikruti as i mentioned in the case of prithvira chauhan is over emphasized self flagellation and it also undermined the dharmic nature in conclusion what we can say as i uh, mentioned in the at the beginning of the session one of the greatest personalities perceived to be greatest personalities once said the history of bharat varsha is that of a defeated race sorry sir this is not that of a defeated race but a triumphant nation against all odds it is the story of a living civilization mahatma gandhi once went on to say that every hindu is a coward every muslim is a bully sorry sir you are also wrong this is not a nation of cowards but of brave hearts where men of honor had slain the barbaric enemies while women rendered their lives for honor so even today if at all there is one particular civilization which can teach lessons how to tame the barbaric civilizations it is only our nation with this notion let's conclude bharat mata ki jai Namaste Vishnu ji I don't Namaste. have a question but I was really moved by your presentation I really appreciated how beautifully you brought out some angles like talking about well if somebody were conquered India 17 times that means they must have lost 16 times you know just the obvious bits that we miss in our bias against ourselves and our people who have done so much for us to be here today and have any semblance of our culture alive i really appreciate you bringing that and the last slide where you were talking about the you know you started off with the stereotypes and you broke it down so systematically and then in the end you said well these are the things we need to keep in mind i i really appreciated the clarity so i don't have questions i just wanted to say a big thanks to you thank you so thank much you. thank you thank you i was wondering uh, what would you say to uh... uh index scholars like conrad ast and uh, simla scholars who say that uh, uh you know you know hindu armies when they are on the cusp of winning if their leader uh, gets killed they scatter and they withdraw from battle uh, something similar seen how the vijayanagara empire ended uh, and uh, another uh, another clarity i wanted to know uh, about was uh, what do you think of uh, treaties when maratha signed treaties with the uh, um islamic invaders yeah yeah the first question is when the hindu king fell the entire army got scattered and we lost the cusp of fame how many times it had happened of course it happened quite a few times like in the case of yamat chandra vikramaditya so yeah that is why i said the problem there is no leader when the leader himself falls the army loses the traction so that might have happened but it happened only once or twice but when the king was killed i can tell you a number of instances where hindu kings were killed but the army continued the war winning and losing battle is a different issue when an empire fell the small kings gathered together and again fought back uh, especially during the battle if a hindu king falls the army got scattered it happened not just with us it happened with most of the Armies even it happened with Alexander when he was trying to motivate his own people, saying that what we are fighting today is just a small piece of kingdom in Bharat that is porous, beyond which we have Magadha, which is waiting for us with the two thousand elephants. The moment they heard this, with five hundred elephants, porous can could uh, porous could create such a havoc. There is no way we can move beyond this. Let's uh, go back. So, uh, the moment Alexander's horse fell. alexander army also got scattered so once the leader falls it is it is but natural the army may lose direction so second thing what was the second question marathas making treaty with the uh, uh i'll try to explain with an another example even rajputs made an alliance i mentioned it in during my talk right so at times even today some hindu groups go and talk with muslims right uh, keeping the circumstances in view so the utmost responsibility of the king is to protect his subjects so if raja jay singh or man singh went and made an alliance with the moguls or maratha made an alliance with the moguls okay maratha peshwa made an alliance with the nizam but at his terms and when rajputs made an alliance because they were too weak to conquer the enemy 
So the, all that they had to do is to protect their subjects. So for the time being, because the dynamics were in favor of the enemy, but whereas in case of Marathas, Marathas dictated the terms most of the times. When they went into pact with Muslims, especially with Nizam or whoever, Marathas dictated them, Marathas collected the bounty. That is how it happened. It is not an ideological pact between Hindu side and Muslim side. It was purely tactical pact. Uh, thank you, Ji. And uh, so it was a wonderful talk. I, uh, you know, I just had a question about Raja Dahil because a lot of people point out to his fall as probably the first salvo in the Islamic invasion and eventually take over of the power centers in India. So there's a rumor, I don't know whether this is substantiated or not, that actually his downfall was caused more by him giving, uh, you know, shelter to descendants of Prophet Muhammad when there was uh, fights between the two sects of Islam happening. And it was them, in fact, that led to his downfall and, and probably backstabbing, if, if I can use that. Is there any truth to that? I just wanted to ask. Yes, or was yeah. it the Buddha, uh, the betrayal of the, the Buddhists that were primarily responsible? Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm not aware of the thing you mentioned, that Raja Dahir was sheltering the fighting sects of the in the Muslim community. But as far, we cannot completely attribute the downfall of Raja Dahir to the treachery of the Buddhist monks, but Buddhist monks also, because from time and again, some of, if this is my personal opinion, I may be wrong, because it was during the times of Ashoka, it was uh, Buddhist philosophy, uh, what do you call, uh, adopted by Ashoka, which debilitated our army. And during Raja Dahi's period, Buddhists thought because their monasteries was taken over by the state, uh, Buddhism was not flourishing in the country, they thought a foreign invader may help them. But there is a historical account to this. But whereas coming to the point you mentioned that Raja Dahi also sheltered the warring groups of the Islam, I'm sorry, I haven't heard, I'll check and come back. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Actually, it was a clarification I wanted to make. Uh, it it was probably the descendants of Prophet Muhammad that were given shelter, uh, you know, in his uh, kingdom, uh, you know, and who were fleeing, you know, the, I would say the results of the battle between the warring factions because everybody wanted to claim and they were threatened. So that's that's been a theory that's been going on again. You know, as you had correctly pointed out, I think in, in, in a subtle way throughout your presentation that a lot of our history is distorted. So you don't know what to... Uh, believe, believe and what not okay. yeah so that, that that's the answer i just wanted to ask like about uh, you know in terms of the because uh, uh, a lot of history is not taught to us about what happened in the deccan right i mean you had alluded to tipu sultan but prior to that the warrior kingdom etc they've been disparaged and and shown as weak right the 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 people who hyderally overthrew so, um, you know, is, is there any documented history over that region, the Dakni region, which would be probably southern Karnataka extending to Hyderabad in terms of their resistance to Islamic invasion and also battles with the British? Documentation part, it is very much there, especially as I mentioned from the period of Kakati Rudrama to Vijayanagara and post Vijayanagara also, how southern states try to resist the uh, Islamic invasions. There is, uh, there is reasonable research. And uh, I mean, we have enough material to go through. Uh, if possible, I'll send you through an email, the reference material. Yes, sir, that would be really helpful because that's a part of history that people don't really talk about. Actually, the thing is that Tipu Sultan has been deified by historians, whereas he was brutal to a bunch of minorities uh, within that region and also altered. On, uh, Tipu Sultan, on Tipu Sultan, there is lots of information available from Hindu side today, the kind of atrocities he committed on Hindus. There's lots of information. There have been a, there has been a book by Sandhya Balakrishna and many others. Uh, as far as the resistance from the other parts of the Deccan is concerned, especially from the Andhra region, Hyderabad region, this region, there is enough material available. So, as I mentioned, I'll send you through the email. Yes, and the last question I had was about uh, Bengal because, uh, you know, uh, there's another theory. And again, because of the distorted history taught to us in our school curricula, we don't know what is genuine and what isn't. But apparently, uh, you know, the Islamic rulers of Bengal were so brutal that when the East India Company, uh, 
you know entered right uh, you know the, the i wouldn't say bengalis per se as it's probably identifying a community disparagingly but that region they welcome the british because essentially they saw themselves as emancipators of the population from the brutality of the islamic invaders so is there any truth to that and and were there any hindu kings in that region or was it you know uh, or uh, d- uh, did the islamization of the ruling uh, leadership happen post the turkic invasions of uh, of levant uh, to my knowledge it was not the people of bengal but the nawab of the bengal the rulers of the bengal who have handed over the bengal to british so people of the bengal may have been like in any, any other region uh, were facing problems with islamic rule but it was the blunder committed by the nawab of the not blunder an intentional move by the nawab of the bengal that handed over the region to the british and bengal uh, and kerala from times uh, i don't know whether it is proper to say but they were never part of aryavarta per se so they have to be dealt separately uh, yes and the last point i had was a request sir because uh, you know uh, again because of this indic resurgence we have seen in the last few years there's been a lot of talk about bihar and how its downfall happened post 1857 for example the the state of bihar or the region of bihar was in, in fact at the forefront of the indic civilization for the longest period of time and okay. i think their participation in 1857 uh, sort of uh, you know led to an, an isolation by the british that left them impoverished and that's it translates to in what we see bihar today but there's not that much of history again it might be in the public domain but it's not been made very obvious so just it would be very helpful you know uh, to have a talk from you on that region as well specifically because of uh, again uh, you know we tend to look at that region very disparagingly in terms of its literacy rate etc forgetting that to till 200 or maybe 250 years back uh, you know that was kind of uh, the forefront of uh, innovation research and even dharma if i can put it that way so just a request sir thank you thank you thanks for for the suggestion sure we'll take it so we have the last question of the talk uh, by shankar ji he asks sir, that there is another stereotype that hindu scholars did not properly understand the nature of the enemy and the ideology of the enemy would you agree or is that a false stereotype too as we stand today with the kind of ideological understanding of islam about islam we have today post especially post 9 11 we have to admit the simple fact that our forefathers our ancestors were way ahead in understanding islam and the language islam understands they dealt it accordingly there is no point in trying to say that our scholars did not understand islam intellectually it's definitely a false narrative and unfortunately it comes from hindu side there is no point in understanding islam because understanding islam is understanding the language which islam understands and this is what our kings de- repeatedly demonstrated today 75 years into independence or even for that matter us uh, with the most resources on the earth having understood islam either europe or us or any of uh, other country can do anything about islam so all that we could do was read quran read hadith now we are trying to engage intellectually with them with a party which is not at all willing to engage with us so islam had never shown any intent of uh, engaging with you intellectually so there is no point in understanding islam intellectually it is always better to teach them in a language which it understands thanks thanks a lot